Hi everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you here on a Friday at lunchtime. Um, welcome to the Wheeler Centre's second instalment of the Double Booked Club. My name's Rebecca Harkins-Cross. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, um, lands whose sovereignty was never ceded, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects also to any elders of other communities that might be with us today. Today, we're so lucky to be joined by two incredible authors, Carrie Tiffany and Peggy Frew, who both have new novels about families in crisis. We'll be talking about girlhood and family ties and asking how family dynamics shape us and warp us. Uh, Firstly, we have Carrie Tiffany. Carrie was born in West Yorkshire and grew up in Western Australia. She spent her early 20s working as a park ranger in Central Australia. Her first novel, Every Man's Rules for Scientific Living, was shortlisted for the Orange Prize, the Miles Franklin Literary Award, the Guardian First Book Award, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, <laughs> I don't know if there's any awards left. Um, and it also won the Dobby Award and the WA Premier's Award for Fiction. Her second novel, Mateship with Birds, was also shortlisted for many awards and won the inaugural Stella Prize and the C Christina Stead Prize for Fiction in the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. Um, beside her, we have Peggy Frew, whose first novel, House of Sticks, won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript and was shortlisted for the UTS Glenda Adams Prize for New Writing. Hope Farm, her second novel, won the Barbara Jeffress Award, was shortlisted for the Stella Prize and the Miles Franken Literary Award, and longlisted for the International Dublin Literary Award. Um, and judging by responses so far to Carrie's latest novel, Exploded View and Peggy's Islands, this list of accolades is only gonna grow in the coming year. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Um, before we begin, could I just get a bit of a show of hands of who has read the books yet? We've got a couple? Okay, yeah, great. We'll try to keep that in mind in the way that we're kind of approaching them, um, but we'll also have ample time for questions at the end, so if you've got any burning ones, make sure to remember them for then. Um, the figure of the young girl who is kind of on the cusp of this adult world is one that you've both explored before in your fiction. In your last novel, Peggy Hope Farm, um, we have both Silver and the flashbacks of her own mother Ishtar as a pregnant teen. And in Mateship with Birds, we had Little Hazel. What is it about this figure that's drawn you both back in the stories of Junie and Anna in Islands and then the unnamed girl in Exploded View? And why was it important to tell their stories through, these stories through their eyes? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> I can't really say no. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's yeah. no main. Yeah. Um, uh, I think um, when I, you know, this is my third novel, and I suspect that I wrote the other novels really because I was avoiding writing this novel, and I feel it's a novel that I. Um, when I started writing, which is just over 10 years ago, um, so I came to writing quite late, having done sort of other things, um, was a novel that I needed to and wanted to write and that I was always going to write, um, but that I had to kind of learn something about craft in order to get there. Mm -hmm. And that how I wrote the novel was going to be sort of very important to re-entering that world. But when I think... Um, you know, why, why a girl, why, why write a novel in which, in, in, in my case, is a very cloistered and claustrophobic um, world of the girl, is that when I was a girl, clearly, you know, at around the same time in the 1970s, I did have this very strong sense of my place in the hierarchy of the family. And, um, you know, I was maybe just above the dog, but not a hell of a lot above the dog. Um, and there was a sense that this idea of, well, there were two things. One, one was that I had a very strong sense that this thing called being a girl, that I was just kind of crap at it, you know, that I was <laughs> failing at it. And that when I looked around me at, you know, people who I, I went to school with, I felt they were just making a much better 
go of this thing called being a girl than I was. I was continually perplexed and confused about what this space was that I was entering, what the rules were, what the expectations were, um, how to be comfortable in this girl thing. It seemed to be a very quite a, quite a difficult space to be in. And when I think about my family life and about Australian culture at that time, um, so my, a lot of my girlhood happened in Western Australia in the 1970s, it was really, um, it was something that was very shadowed, I think, and it was conducted in a, a kind of backwards rather than a forwards way. So there was a lot of negative space. So I spent a lot of time looking around and thinking about what other people were doing. My brother, you know, only doing half what my brother was doing seemed appropriate. Watching how my mother behaved in her relationships, watching women on TV and women in the world and thinking, well, kind of being a girl was actually something about um, watching other people and finding a bit of space for you that wasn't offensive, mm -hmm. didn't draw attention to yourself, um, but was certainly something that was kind of reactive rather than proactive. Mm. So it wasn't about having an interest or a desire in something and thinking, I want that, I want to know about that, I want to find out about that, I want to do that, I want to be that. It wasn't anything like that at all. It was actually a very cautious and a very loaded um, place for me to be. And I think for a lot of other Australian girls growing up at that mm. time, and even from what I see now, I'm not sure a hell of a lot mm. has that really changed. And that was one of the reasons when I finished the book and I actually had a very big question as to whether I would publish it or not. And I wondered whether I had in fact just really written it for me. But when I did show a few people the book, that they did feel that there was something in it that could still speak, well, both to kind of women my age, mm -hmm. I suppose, families, people, but also to kind of contemporary girls as well. So, um, so it, it, it seemed to be something worth saying. Mm. How about you, Peggy? Because I, I read that you also, um, this is a story that you'd been putting off telling that you started an incarnation of it in your 20s and have returned to it. Yeah, yeah. that is that is really interesting, isn't it? Mm. I So, um, Islands, there was an early version of Islands which was really my kind of practice novel that I wrote during my 20s before I even had any idea that I would ever become a published author. Um, so I was essentially writing it for myself, I think. Uh, and then it, it, you know, it was a, it never saw the light of day and, and rightly so. It was a kind of um, first go at being a writer. Um, and then I, when I finished Hope Farm, yeah, I had this kind of sense that there was something still waiting there. Um, a world to go back into and I thought, oh, it is, it's that, that material um, about the island and the family and, um, and it is very much, um, you know, I think like a lot, of, a lot of authors very first goes at writing, there's a lot of my own experience in it. Well, there's a lot of my own experience in everything I write because that's just kind of the way I work, I think, but um, I really did draw on my own experiences of girlhood, which um, I'm 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 kind of glad, but also sad to say we're not not nearly as kind of um, bleak as what you described, Carrie. I actually find that really upsetting. Mm. Uh, um, I suppose because I'm a, mo a mother of girls, and I just f feel enormously outraged that girls still have that experience of being informed about what not to be and what space not to enter into and what a horrible way to be begin um, a life. But I didn't really, I mean, I, I, I think that that was a part. I, I think it's very hard to grow up as a girl in Australia and not experience some of that. So I think that was there for me as well. Um, uh, yeah, so going back to it, I what was still in it that was still really alive that made me want to use that material again. And when I say use it again, it wasn't like I ever even opened the file or looked at that early manuscript. I, it was just all there in my mind. Um, and it wasn't the same plot line or anything, but it was a similar setup with the family and the setting. Um, but I just think I've got this enduring 
fa fascination slash obsession with mo mother-daughter relationships mm. and I think that is informed by my experiences of being a daughter and of being a mother. Um, and I guess the good thing about having left that stuff behind, that early, not, not, not really tried to keep working on that early practice novel at the time and make something of it, you know, the good thing about setting it aside was I think that I probably knew on some level that I didn't know yet. Or perhaps like you said, Carrie, I didn't fully have the skills to do what I needed to do with it. But also I didn't have the lived experience because I was in my early 20s when I started writing that. I'm in my early 40s now and I've since become a mother so I had that whole other half of the mother-daughter relationship to, to draw on mm -hmm. from, from my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you said there, Carrie, so much of that, um, the idea of girlhood in these books is relational within the kind of hierarchies of the family dynamic. Um, you write in Exploded View, girls get to play parts too, but their costumes are not for science or the skills of life. They are for men to put their eyes on. Um, I'm wondering if you could both talk a little bit more about what roles these girls are playing and particularly within those very complex um, and sometimes dysfunctional family dynamics that they're situated within. Would you like me to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Thanks. Um, which, which girl? Should I be talking well, about? Well, that, that's yeah. something we've, we've got to get on to, exactly how many voices and characters yeah. that you're able to intertwine there. But I, I guess I'm thinking particularly about the, the sisters, Junie and Anna. And yeah. Anna. Well, maybe I will talk about Junie because mm -hmm. I feel like she is the main character yeah. in the book, even though it's from multiple perspectives. So um, Islands is about a family. Um, there are two parents, Helen and John, and two daughters, Junie, the older daughter, and Anna, the younger daughter. Uh, and they kind of grow up through the 1980s and um, in the – and this isn't giving anything away because I think it's on the back of the book – but uh, in the mid-90s, I think early to mid-90s, when Anna is 15 years old, she just vanishes and um, the family doesn't know what's happened to her. And so Anna is kind of the absence at the heart of the book and the book really is about um, all of the other characters – that kind of form this sort of web around that hole and, and we only ever see Anna through their perspectives as they try and figure out what happened to her and go through what her disappearance does to them. Um, so Junie, I've, I feel like I might need to be reminded again of exactly what I'm trying to answer, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, the roles the roles that um, that a character like Junie is playing within within this kind of, um, yeah, bigger family story and the way that, that loss is kind of rippling through it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so Junie, um, I, she plays the role of the big sister, really, in the family. And um, one thing that happens... Um, so the, the family is affected by kind of two major events. One is the d disappearance of Anna, which is just major is an understatement. That's, you know, a kind of um, devastating experience for the family. But the other thing that happens um, a couple of years before Anna disappears is that the marriage, Helen and John's marriage, breaks down. And I think that what often happens or what I've observed in Australian families of that particular vintage, um, which is the kind of family that I grew up in, um, is that often the father in a family like that finds himself without his wife anymore and um, doesn't have anyone to talk to, isn't very good about talking about things and the older daughter becomes his support and his confidant. And um, that I think that, that that's a very dangerous terrain. <laughs> um, and I'm, I was kind of interested in that. So Junie, I guess she, I guess that this is something that I, I ca I've written about before, it, like the character of Silver who has to grow up too quickly because her mother's um, sort of not able to be a good, a, a good enough mother to her. Um, Junie sort of steps into this role of the, the, the confidant, and she's, she 
she feels almost honoured that her father has chosen her to sort of confide in. Um, so that kind of builds up this role where she is absorbing all of his grief and anger and all of his uh, feelings about what's happened. Um, and it's a very one-way process. And so I suppose that we, we, we meet Junie when she's 11 or 12, when this is starting to happen, and we, we kind of meet her again and again throughout the book up until she's kind of in her mid to late 30s, I think. Um, and she sort of has to eventually figure out what being the big sister and being the good girl in the family, what it cost her, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have those wonderful scenes uh, in the car where the two girls are fighting over who has to sit in the front beside Dad because Dad's probably going to start crying when you mm. get on the road. How does Anna respond differently to Junie in that situation? So Anna... Um, yeah, it was really... I really enjoyed being able to write how Anna reacts to John's grief um, because she just will... She she is just not interested in absorbing, you know, one speck of his feelings and so she just kind of blocks him. But I suppose that means that then she... She does end up being cut off from him, more or less, so it, it, it does cost her the relationship. Um, yeah, so it's funny that I, these two sisters, the way I see them, Junie's the good girl and she sort of quietly does what, what the family needs of her, but in a way that makes her very isolated because nobody's asking her how she's going and she doesn't have anyone to tell how she's feeling. But then Anna, who is the kind of wild child, um, and before Anna disappears, she's getting into a lot of trouble. She's not going to school, she's drinking, she's possibly using drugs, she's kind of going out at night and not coming home. And So she's kind of gone outwards, but also she's not kind of connected to anyone in the family either. So they're mm -hmm. both experiencing these two different types of isolation. Mm -hmm. um, your vision of girlhood is so different in some ways, Carrie, um, on the kind of basis um, level in which I guess really is class terms, one family go on these leisurely annual summer holidays um, to this quite idyllic setting of, um, of the island, which um, we eventually glean as Phillip Island. Um, whereas this girl who, who isn't even given a name within Exploded View, um, goes on this very nihilistic family car trip that they drive across the centre of Australia. I think it's for eight days and basically turn around and, and come back again. Um, how how did you how did you go about creating this character and especially the voice for this character who is um, is so isolated and so silenced in these various ways, um, which she takes on literally. Um. Voice is really hard to talk about. That, yeah. that seems antithetical, but voice is hard to talk about because there is something mysterious about a voice, um, a voice in a book, in a novel. I think it's probably, you know, one of the reasons we read is that sense that in a novel, either a character in a book, that you can know someone in a way that we can't know each other. You know, we're sort of strangers even, you know, to people that we love and we think we know intimately. So we can get this <coughs> internal access, this really kind of close access. And that was very much my intention um, with the book is that here's a young woman who, because of her circumstances, is literally silenced in the world. She doesn't speak for very long periods of time. But it doesn't mean um, she's not alive and it doesn't mean she's not intelligent and sensual and noticing and part of the world. Um, and in fact, she, I think she says at one point about not speaking that you're only lost to others, you're not yeah. lost to yourself. Mm -hmm. So this idea that I could represent herself in, in, this, in this way was important to me. And I think the thing with the voice really was that I would write and I would write and I would write and then I would know instantly 
when something was not voice or out of voice or when I had strained for voice and it was not appropriate and I would get rid of it. And so there was this constant sort of process of, of um, taking away. And then there are mechanisms also within the book that um, make the kind of the, the metaphors that I'm using, which are a lot to do with kind of gender um, and, and sort of the things of the world. So engines and automotives are very important in the book. And the girl uses the idea of the family very much as being uh, an engine, a motor. Her, her stepfather is a mechanic. And so there's a lot of kind of engines and motors and automotive repairs around uh, as a way of trying to sort of understand the family. And she sees herself as being a part of this kind of schema of the engine mm -hmm. and all of the members of the family as being sort of parts of that. And also just the, the idea of the car as being a kind of vehicle or container for the family mm. and being very kind of emblematic for that. And my family did, when I was 14 in Perth, get in the car and drive to Cairns. <laughs> and uh, we slept in the car overnight. I slept on the uh, uh, above the transmission hump on the floor at the back. My brother had the back seat. And... Um, it took about, yeah, it took seven or eight days, I think, and we spent three days in Cairns, and then we drove home again. <laughs> and so I have qu quite intense memories of that, yeah. even though it was a very long period of time ago. And I did want to capture something about that, because in fact, for the girl in the book, even though that sounds like utter hell, there was a sense of sort of relief, mm -hmm. really, in that, because she was kind of safe in... in uh, in, in that situation where other people were around her all of the time. Um, and I remember myself when um, going on that trip, you know, I, I, um, my family migrated from West Yorkshire to Western Australia. I came when I was seven and I remember being, you know, utterly uh, struck by the Australian environment and the climate and the difference of everything. And then I, I go to primary school in, in WA and it's all about click go the shears and all this kind of outback stuff and it's all kind of Ned Kelly and men in moleskins and whatever. And we just lived in the suburbs but this idea that at the age of 14 I was going to finally see the outback mm. was very exciting for me and I thought it was going to be, you know, Marlborough country. You know, remember those Marlborough country <laughs> ads? I was in love with all those Marlborough men riding those horses, smoking those cigarettes. Um, uh, and I thought it was going to be like that, and yet it wasn't at all like that. And it seemed to me that as we were kind of driving into the heart of Australia and we went across the Nullarbor and then we went up to, through Broken Hill and then kind of up the, the side of the coast that way, but particularly in that sort of central area around Broken Hill, that we were kind of driving into the heart of the family in some ways, that we were driving mm. into this kind of intense loneliness. And even though there were the four of us in the car, we were as separate from each other in, in our positions, you know, sort of stapled in our positions in the car that you could possibly get. So, mm. And there was a lot of time for kind of thinking and reflection and just, you know, with my eyes sort of peeled to, mm. to the window and seeing what went past and mm. death, you know, dead, dead this, dead that, dead. <laughs> I want to I want to get back to landscapes in both these books in a second. Um, but one thing I'm interested in there is you, you know um, the fact that she feels she feels safe within this environment, but also within the car she feels some sense of control. Um, and in these kind of transgressions that she has, where she steals cars at night. And, and takes them on the open road. Um, she also gets some kind of sense of escape or freedom. Um, but I'd really love for you to read that passage that kind of shows some of the, the ways through these minor acts of um, transgression that, that she rests back some control that's being denied to her. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you think they're minor, because yeah. I've had well. some <laughs> questions where people have been very uh, concerned about the criminality in the book. So. Um, so, so the the narrator um, lives with her her mother and her brother and her stepfather on in the outskirts of Perth, and her stepfather runs a sort of dodgy mechanics business at the back of the property, and he has an unlicensed business where he sort of fixes the neighbours' cars or doesn't fix the neighbours' cars for free, uh, not for free for money. Um, and, um, you know, the, the narrator, uh, who's a teenage girl, is involved in a sort of power, silent power struggle with him. 
And uh, one of the ways that she takes revenge against him is to get up at night and to go up to the workshop and to damage the cars. Um, and uh, this is just a, 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 little, a little part about that. At dinner, my mother has her Mills and Boone on the table and there's the television for us. The telephone rings. Father man says not to answer it. My brother washes up, I dry. Then I read a bridal magazine from the tip in my room. I think I'd like to sleep. I try to sleep. There's no firm plan in my mind for sabotage, but after a few hours I climb out of the window and go to the cars. There are always cars to go to. You might just touch them or sit in them or try to sleep a little, even across a bench seat. There's no plan to hurt them until you do. It's not a crime if your mouth does it. Soft parts or hard parts, it's just the same. Your two lips making a seal around the hose, your teeth pushing through tired rubber. There are fibres crisscrossed in there, a weak kind of string. The last bit is more grinding than biting. Where it was one firm thing, now it hangs double, ragged, and you feel sorry about that. Afterwards, the oil and the bits of rubber stick to the insides of your cheeks and are foul in your mouth, so you need to spit them into the dirt. It's not a crime if your hand does it when your eyes are shut. Blind reaching, blind stroking, skin on metal, fingertips tickling bolts, the slackening of the part as its fastenings loosen and then the cool fall of it into the hand, draped then quickly in a rag or pocketed. The sky will be black after, but a dog won't always be barking. If a dog is barking, even a long way away, you can reach out for each beat so you don't have to listen to the air going in and out of your ribs and the heart over hot in there too. It's not a crime if your hand does it while you look the other way. You can do it outside or in the workshop. There are pinholes in the roofing iron for starlight to get through. There are tools with yellow plastic grips that are happy like toys. And you get better at it, so your eyes don't even ask to look anymore and your skin isn't nervous. You can use the trowel or a broken piece of star picket to dig a hole and bury the part. Don't bury them too close together. Avoid a cluster. Give them their own plot. The ground is never too hard for digging. Even with a large part, there isn't much excess. The dirt and the stones make room for the part and fit back together again, much like before. If you don't look at what you're doing, if you do everything by feel, there are no witnesses. There's the stain on you, but that can be cleaned away. And then the only thing that's left is what you felt. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to hear that passage in your voice and, and hear how much um, you're able to, as you said before, you know, she's still a character who desires, even though this is a, a narrative that is um, in some ways orbiting, orbiting around some kind of trauma, um, but there's still a sensuality there, but there's this awful, awful violence always lurking beside it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, these kind of moments of, of transgression or escape are something that Junie and Anna seem to do as well. Maybe maybe these are more major transgressions in your book, Carrie. Um, but there's those scenes where the, in the beginning Junie goes and, and hides in the sand dunes, which doesn't seem to be for any particular reason, but to have a little moment of respite um, or Something, it's something that increases for Anna um, in the moments before she's disappearing, um, you know, sneaking out at night and having these kind of um, empty streets to herself. Um, is, this, is this a reaction to, you know, what's happening within the family dynamic or is it something about um, girlhood more generally that, that these girls don't have power in any other spaces? 
Oh, good question. Probably both. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think that we probably have all had the experience when you're a child of, of I don't think you're ever as intensely engaged in environments mm -hmm. um, again in your life, you know, whether it's, I think it's just all the time. That, <laughs> well, anyway, when we mm -hmm. were children, I don't know what it would be like now that people are just like, on the screen all the time but um <laughs> uh yeah you know oh, i can just things like i can still kind of remember the you know classrooms that i spent so many hours in as a as a young child and just the details of like mm. the shape of the desk and the pencils and the window and the smell and the carpet and um yeah, so I think that is just a general childhood experience but mm. um certainly for for Junie and Anna because they've been holidaying at this island with their family their whole lives, um, when things start to go awry with their parents, they both take refuge in the environment there, which they know within themselves, you know, it's kind of like their, um, the way they are in that, in that world is second nature to them. Mm. Mm. Perhaps that's a, a good time for you to read your passage because something you do so beautifully, um, yeah, is the intimacy of that environment, um, which is different for each character and also something that, that shifts for them throughout their lives. Okay, so this is just, it's, it's right at the beginning, it's only on the second page, so I probably just don't need to explain anything, um, but it's about the island. Bless you. Um, and there was an island, not too far from the city and the house on the hill, about two hours in the car. Since before you were a baby, we went there for our holidays and one of us goes there still. Ah, the island of your childhood. The beach is small, even at low tide. The rock pools are small and round and shallow. The dunes are mostly low, but they rise as they approach the point and the formations of red rock, soft, waxy feeling, carved in places with laborious initials, love hearts, swear words that the beach is named for. In the high dunes, there are silvery runner grasses, semi-buried, their sandy roots hidden, sturdy and enduring. There are squat mounds of a kind of succulent, its stems stubby and juicy, its pink summer flowers threadbare and brave. Between the beach and the houses, in the wide band of tea tree, shadowy and dense and tunnelled through with soft paths, there are beige and grey branch ceilinged rooms filled with dapples and bark and scatters of very small, dry, minty leaves. There are fat tongues of interwoven creepers and papery thickets that smell of ants. There are tiny glades, carpets of unblemished sand, a log seat, magic circle of sky, squeaky stemmed shoots, bright green, bearing tiny blue flowers, a sudden miniature mossy hill. Islands within the island, whole and private worlds. Here on the beach is where you were brought as a baby, were held and kissed and set down, the bodies of the adults like rocks at the corners of your eyes, their voices thinning away, the waves and the air and the sand all shimmying their infinite particles and you breathing, reaching. Here, up at the house in the garden, is where you stood, a naked toddler in a tin tub Water escaping your fists, rolling silver down your pearly skin, your grandmother kneeling by you in the smell of lemons and earth. Here on the concrete porch in the white sun is where you lay, nine, ten, eleven years old, and read books and ate stone fruit, the juice dripping into the cracks. Here, back down and through the gate and over the fire track, are the morning glory vines. Their spreading leaves are rich and European green. 
their violet blooms ready to darken and wilt almost as soon as they are picked. Here is where you crouched with a drooping flower behind your ear and watched through twisted grey branches your mother walk away along the beach. Here, on the beach, in the dunes, in the scrub, in the garden, in a dry, hot inland paddock that you galloped across on a pony with a helmet fallen over your eyes, here is your island. Nobody else can know it, but there wasn't only you. Thank you so much. Um, your landscapes are, are so intimate and that's just the perfect passage to show it, but the landscapes that you depict, Carrie, um, they're at once kind of very particular and everywhere as well. Um, in terms of in terms of this this image of the outback, there's kind of you can see that real world referent, but it's also this kind of um, you know mythic outback in some ways. There was there was a passage from I think when they're on the road trip where you write the nothing in the outback is thick and rich. If we stopped the car now and I opened the door and walked off the road into the outback, I think the outback would kill me, or maybe I would kill the outback. I think only one of us would survive. Uh, were you thinking about these real landscapes that you'd encountered on trips like this, or was it more that's kind of um, almost at the, that Australian cinematic idea of the landscape? Um, well, there's there's always a kind of jumble of images mm. and impressions and things. So I think you know there's some initial kind of memories of of the actual trip, and then I actually spent quite a long time working in Central Australia as a young woman. Um, and so, and I had sort of long periods on my own and a lot of kind of four-wheel driving and camping at remote locations and um, very kind of quiet times really in the bush, which were pretty important to me. And then, but I did f find when I sat down to write the book that I needed to sort of be, be in, in, in those places again. And in fact, I was living in, I was living overseas. I'd been living in Germany for a year. And I came back and it's the first time in my life that I didn't have a car. I always have a car. And I actually really liked driving despite my early experience. Um, and uh, so I had to hire a car and I redid some of the that inland trip. Not, not all across the Nullarbor, but kind of the eastern states, bit of it. Um, and I sort of really tried to sort of pay attention to that sort of sense of the road and silence and um, and some of the things actually that happened to me, and this is just a few years ago, I think in 2015 I did this trip, actually ended up in the novel as if they had happened in the 1970s, which is an indication that very little has actually <laughs> changed. So, yeah. 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 Um, I want to talk as well, because um, I'm conscious we're getting very close to question time, a little bit about the style of both these books and the kind of fragmentation um, that, you, that you've chosen to tell these stories. Was that something that you set out to do or was it something that became, you know, the only way that you could deal with um, these lives that are fragmented in various ways? I... Um Yes and yes. I, I uh, well, I what what I set out. I actually set out to write a collection of short stories because I think uh, when I finished Hope Farm, the novel before Islands, I just thought, God, I just don't want to write another novel. They're just so big and heavy, and you know, you have to drag it around for three or four years, and it's exhausting. And and I, so I thought, well, I, I'll just I'll just do. I'll cobble something together and I'll do little bits here and there. Um, but I, you know, so I was being lazy really, but I, but actually I, I, I don't think I was being lazy because I think it was that actually the material needed to be told that way and I figured that out as I went along. Um, uh, because, um, because I was writing about a family and, and uh, and there's always one, one, more than one story in a family, and I was interested in that. So I was interested in the the, the range of different perspectives, um, and also I was writing about people whose 
lives had been completely blown up by a, a completely uncontrollable scenario that goes on, you know. And so I was really interested in how people try and continue to make sense of the world when something that they've always relied upon understanding is no longer understandable. Mm. So that these are people whose lives have been have been shattered. And so it really so after a while I realized that it really was the way that the, the book was asking to be written because it was it was about about an experience of shattering. So in a way I had to try and replicate that in mm. the in the form of the book. Mm. And yeah. it's a, so much really oh, successful, Peggy, in the mm. book. I had that because, Greg, you use the word shatter, the sense that there's a portrait of this family and it's behind glass in some ways, but it's smashed, but it's still intact. Mm. But there are all of these shards and it's as if you've mm. taken out each shard and you've kind of investigated it and then you've put it back together again. And it's so kind of complete. There's just, as you get to the end you realise why every kind of single piece is there. It's like some really perfect puzzle. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> and it says so much about the way they're experiencing time in the wake mm. of that event as well. The, it allows you that ability to, to show that their chron chronologies get kind of scrambled in the wake of it. How about you, Carrie? Your style... Um, you know, from if you move through each book seems to be stripping more and more away to the point now um, that it's almost modernist in the concision of your prose here. How did you how did you get to that point? I imagine it's a lot of work to to strip things away that much. Mm. Um, well, I have a kind of some processes that are perhaps um, I like the idea of being a novelist where you have an idea, a grand idea, and you sit down and you write the grand idea. But unfortunately, I can't do that. and I'm just sort of <laughs> unable to do that. My work often, um, well, always actually, references other texts. Mm. And I'm kind of interested in if you could make a book from existing things that are around. And often they're strange and arcane things that I'm interested in. So things about soil conservation or birds or... You know, the, 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 the text behind this book is a manual for a Holden, an H.R. Holden. <laughs> and I actually, bits of the manual are actually kind of in the book and I, the, the language of the manual, which I find quite kind of poetic in some ways, mm. the idea of the exploded view, um, as, it, which comes from the manual, is very important to that. So I'm sort of led by these other texts and then I'm led by the fact that I'm unable to write what happens next, unfortunately. I'm just sort of, I can't do it. So I can't write that the sentence which is like, and the next morning, or <laughs> I just cannot, there's just something about me, I can't do it. And I also can never write a sentence which was, she felt this. Somehow to me, there's a kind of distance there where the writer is being a writer and a kind of treating a character like a puppet in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to find a way where I'm actually trying to kind of get in behind and sort of f use the sort of actual physical eyes of the character. So when I use the kind of I for first person, I'm actually really using the E-Y-E-I, -E -I, I hope. Mm. Um, so, so there's this fragmented way of writing. So I can't write what happens next, even though I know I need to. So I just write kind of where the heat or the urgency mm. is. So I just think, yes, I, I'll write something about this, which seems completely unrelated to maybe anything else. And then when I've collected quite, quite a lot of these bits, I, I print them out and then I physically... I move the furniture out of the house <laughs> and it's really good if it happens in summer, better than in winter. And then I put all of the bits together um, and they generally, you know, I'm a miniaturist, they're quite small fragments. And then I spend a little while just kind of walking around and looking at them and trying to work out where the relationships are. And then, then I'm sort of piling it up as I'm going and I have some sort of messy manuscript. And then there's a lot of kind of reworking at that stage to sort of work out what, what I've missed or what, what, uh, what, are, what are the things I need to say within it. Mm. But I think the whole thing about the whole difficulty of a novel is really managing time, isn't it? It's really impossible. It's really hard. The whole idea of kind of that you can take something like time and you can put time into language is just mysterious, kind of magical, really. So 
how it's actually done. I'm, all, I'm really interested in sort of reading, like almost with a scalpel when I read other people's work and think, how did that, where did, how did that happen? How did they do that? Yeah. I, I just love hearing that you uh, operate on such a kind of, um, oh, uh, intuitive level because I, I, I often feel like there's something wrong with me that I don't, I never have a plan when I'm writing a book and I don't know what's going to happen and I have the same problem with, you know, and then and the next morning. Um, sure. Yeah, so um, it's good to know that that if you're doing it that maybe I can, <laughs> can also do it that way. Chaos, chaos, Although chaos. it is terrifying kind of blundering into the darkness but it's also, it is, there, there is a magic to it and that, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not at all a kind of new agey or superstitious person but I do... I love the fact that I don't really understand mm. where a book comes from in mm. me and, um, yeah, it's kind of exciting. Mm. Yeah. There's a great um, Seabold quote where he says something about writing is trying to make your brain go somewhere that it hasn't been before, about that kind of, yeah, that magic of making mm. a connection that you couldn't have done through any other way. I also love the, that image of something that's cerebral becoming quite physical and visual, the way you kind of pace around those objects of paper. Um, this is probably where we should open it up to questions, even though I have a million more that I would love to ask these two. Um, we've got some lovely volunteers who are walking around with microphones. Um, so if you do have a question, just raise your hand um, and wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, also, please do try to make it a question rather than a statement because we um, yeah, would love to hear some more from these writers. Anyone? Really? Come on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask one more and give you guys some time um, to, to sit on it because I'm sure you do have a million more um, once everyone stops being shy. Um, one thing I was interested in is when I when I thought about it, how prominent um, the teenage girl actually is in the kind of canon of Australian literature, if you think about things like Picnic at Hanging Rock or um, The Harp in the South. Um, another book that was coming to mind was Kate Jennings' Snake. I was wondering if there were any of these kind of, um, you know, examples of these stories that you were writing towards or maybe writing in response to as well, wanting to write away from certain kinds of these narratives. Um, well, I'm n n not, I wasn't, I didn't have sort of particular characters in mind and I yep. didn't think I'm going to sort of do something there, but certainly some novels are important to me. Um, Kate Grenville's Dark Places, mm -hmm. which I think is a really fabulous, fabulous novel that's been very important to me. Could you tell us a little bit about it for people who might not have read it? In no, I think way. you have no? to read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you really have to read it. Just read it. Okay. If you haven't read it, it's or if you haven't read it for a while, just go back and yeah. read it. I, ha I, I'm, I'm that. Tell me what your novel about. Even in other books, I find really it's, it's um, somehow you always reduce something in this process of trying to um, say what it's about. But uh, and the other novel is um, a novel by Elizabeth Jolly that I read when I was sixteen, and it's called Palomino. And I thought it was going to be a novel about golden horses. <laughs> and it's a novel, here I am, it's a novel about. Um, but it's uh, an intense sort of lesbian psychological thriller. And it's extremely dark and it sort of just really knocked me out completely. And, and it's quite short as well. And I think I had this kind of sense that how this could be contained within a book, how this, you know, um, how language can be used to express meaning in this way. I was just astonished by, really, mm. really astonished by. So those two were sort of particularly mm. important. But it's not as if I've read them or I reread them recently, but mm. I just kind of know that they're sort of there as touchstones in some can. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's really interesting because, Peggy, you talked, uh, you described um, the, the feeling of exploded view as, as living inside that text um, and it's remarkable in something that is so concise that you just feel it closing in on you in so many ways. It becomes this kind of all-encompassing world. Yeah. How about you? Were there any, any um, texts you were looking towards? Um, I have a few things that I often go back to when I want to um, be reminded of what I'm aspiring to. Um, which is uh, usually 
Helen Garner's kind of early, not not Monkey Grip, but so much, but um, the Children's Bark, which mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. Um, novella after that, and Honor and Other People's Children, which are yeah. two sort of long form stories. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just the kind of fiction I want to write. So mm-hmm. I I think I read them every time I'm working on a book when I, you know, usually about the three quarters of the way through, Mark to just kind of reset, go back to my intention. Um, but in terms of the the teenage girl um, as this kind of, I don't know, um, archetypal mm. archetypal character um, in Australian fiction, I was tremendously influenced by the writing of Gillian Mears when mm. I was um, a teenager and into mm. my and followed her career into my adult life. Um, I just think that she um, she evokes adolescent experience about as well as anyone that I've read Mm -hmm. Um, and it's particularly Australian but without ever seeming, you know, flamboyantly or obviously so. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's deep, deep writing really. It's, it's, yeah, you you are in that world when you read Mm -hmm. her stuff. It's so kind of, you you bodily, it's a bodily experience. Um, And uh, the other one is... um, Cat's Eye by by mm. Margaret Atwood. Um, I've, I go I go back to that quite regularly because um, that's also a book about t- uh, uh, well, it's about a woman, um, but it's about what the way in which her childhood has uh, affected her. And mm. and I I mean I, I I love that book for so many reasons, but I think she her her control of of time and the way that she mm. moves back and forth through time is just impeccable in that mm. book. Um, I mean, it's Margaret Atwood. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do we have some questions now? You can pop up your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, how important do you think? Is it for young women today to see strong role models portrayed in modern literature? Uh, as as yeah, as important as it's always been, I think. Um, it, it. Did you mean yeah. as characters? Do you mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it definitely, I suppose I can only talk about what it was like for me as a reader, as a, as a, did you say girls or young women? Young, young. <laughs> young women. Yeah, I mean, God, I, I was very, I took a very long time to grow up. Like, I don't think I really could have qualified as an adult until I was probably into my 30s. But, um, so... I, what amazes me actually about when I look back on my reading experience is how just completely accidental and uh, um, um, sort of uninformed it was. You know, I really just read whatever I picked up, in, mm-hmm. which was my, the books in the house that I grew up in, the books that I f- found in the school library. And then kind of when I realised that I was someone that was really into books, I was like, right, so what are the books that the, that the literary people, you know what's the canon or whatever. And when I was like, you know, 15, 16, it was all these white white dudes, you know. It was like, oh, you should read Dostoevsky. And that's not to say that that stuff isn't worthwhile, but um, I didn't really, I think until Julia Mears, I really didn't come across a lot of stuff that was written by and about women. You know, teachers would say, oh, you really should read this and then give you The Great Gatsby or On the Road or something, you know, if they thought it was good, they were going to be a bit edgy and... <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think it's 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 really important. But I, what I also think is one of the most beautiful things about the world of books is that you can find it yourself, you know. And when you find other readers and you and people start pressing books into your hand, it it happens, you know. And um, so I see my my daughters doing that now, you know, um, sharing books with their friends and and reading books and and. That are that are written by women and about women and girls that are really I think very positive portrayals and and when I say positive I don't just mean like where the female character has some kind of triumph or that they're worthy or messagey books I just mean I just mean 
well-developed characters that are female, you know, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I don't think that um, writers need to feel or should need to feel that they are responsible for for representing kind of plucky, intelligent young women or anything. Um, I think we need to show us in all of our guises um, and for that to, you know, represent our society, which is what writing does. I think I'd be... I'd like to see a, a literary future, in fact, in which male writers were deeply interested in writing about girls and about girlhood mm -hmm. and where male writers were interested in writing about issues around maternity and early childhood and babies. Um, I I'm, would be... Love to be able to push into have been able to push into the hands of my son when he was growing up books by male writers that were deeply interested in the women around them and the women of the world. So I think that's actually something that I'm hoping will change. It's interesting, everyone kind of got very interested in Nausgaard recently and this kind of auto fiction. And one of the reasons I think people got interested in Nausgaard was that he wrote very openly about being a father of very young children, about his wife having babies and him helping to look after these babies and feeling the struggles and sometimes loves and hates and distresses and muck of that. And that was so strange to us for a man to write about that. He was mm. tremendously lauded for something that, of course, women <laughs> have been writing about for centuries. Um, so there's some, there's you know, a lot that kind of needs to happen there. Still, if you look at the statistics for the Booker Prize, uh, the majority of winners will be men, but also the majority of win winners, um, the characters in the book will be male. Uh, the, the main characters will be male. It's very unusual still for um, a book to win the Booker Prize where the protagonist, the main character, is female. That is still very, very unusual. So that's, you know, hopefully will will change. But it's this is not just the responsibility of women. This is mm. the responsibility of our whole society, all writers. Um, we've probably got time for one more quick question, if there is any here. Yep, we've got one at the front. Can we just, sorry, we'll just wait for the microphone because we are live streaming. Thanks. Mine's a more particular one. I've, I've found the writing about Helen's parents and her life, it, it took on a, an energy, uh, a different kind of energy from, and I was wondering if you, if anyone else thought that or you were aware of it. I mean, I was horrified at, at, at that story that's that part of the story just um i was so i don't know moved uh, for helen's life you know what it'd be so <laughs> yeah so yeah so this is a question for me um and it's he helen is the mother character mm -hmm. in the book and um at one point we we sort of get her her backstory i suppose so the 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 book yeah, I was kind of talking before about the splintering, but I don't know whether I really described well enough for people who haven't read it. That so the, there are there are sections in the book that are from the points of view of different characters, but also the style kind of differs. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, there's a couple of the sections are lists of paintings in a in an art exhibition, and one of the sections is um, one half of a conversation in a therapist's office so you, you only get to hear what one person's saying, you have to imagine what the other person's saying. So I, I, I did, the book, um, the experience of writing it was really just this sort of feeling of that I was con trying to construct this, this quite holistic portrait of the story of this family and what happens because of the, dis the disappearance of this girl, Anna. Um, but I, I would. I, I didn't know which voice was going to come next, or what part of this. You know, it wasn't like I'd go, ah, okay, I need this piece of the puzzle, and it's going to fit here, and it's going to look like this. I really would just. I'd finish with one voice, and then I'd sort of sit down at the computer the next day and kind of just see what came out. And so, but the the story of Helen and her. Um, oh, do I need to worry about that flashing light? Just a, telling just us a to second. stop. I think it's okay. Yeah, okay. Keep going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of there's a red flashing light there. Um, it's very ominous. Uh, 
I, I, I knew that I needed to, or I, I, I wanted to go into Helen's backstory because we get to see her from the points of view of the other characters and they, she, her behaviour is judged every now and then by them and, and um, you know, she's responsible for the end of the, the marriage and, and Junie in particular really blames Helen for what happens and in some way blames her for Anna's disappearance because of Helen's behaviour and the end of the relationship. Um, so I sort of thought I needed to know more about Helen and why she did that stuff but it, it was one of the last sections that I wrote in the book and it, it for some reason I, I, I was I didn't feel like it was going to come easily and then I just had this idea Helen's a very greedy person she um, she's kind of always eating and taking pleasure in food and sex and she's she's kind of a hedonist I guess and then I just started writing about I didn't know what her story was going to be really mm -hmm. um, so I just started with food and I started imagining her childhood and where, what food meant in her the house that she grew up in and um, it it just explained her to me and so I I don't know that that would necessarily answer your question about it feeling very different, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to have to leave it there, but we're very lucky to be joined by some booksellers from the Hill of Content who have all of. Um, all of Peggy and Carrie's books here today, I think, um, and especially these new ones, which you should definitely grab a copy of if you haven't already. We're also very lucky that they're gonna be signing copies of the books. So if there's anything you wanna say, you can pop up for, to the signing table as well. Uh, please join me um, otherwise in, in thanking our wonderful guests, Peggy Frew and Carrie Dickman. Thank you.